All right, 2 Timothy chapter uh, number 2. Let me read you, if I could, just for the sake of starting off, and then I want to give you some contextual things. Look, if you will, in chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of them own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away." Brother Saputo, would you pray, please? It's good to see you and your wife with us tonight. Would you pray and ask the Lord to bless the message, please? Our Father in heaven, we are so very thankful that uh, last week we gathered together to hear from your word, Father. We're glad that uh, you have shared with us when two or more are gathered in your name that you're in the midst of us. And we just, we know we don't deserve that, God, but we are so very thankful that uh, you're here. Pray that you agree with our preaching. Pray that uh, we focus on the things that are Amen. All right. Now, contextually, I want you to look at, you've already seen the things in 2 Timothy, so you know there's doctrinal issues, and you know also that there's demonic activity. So when you start to see that, you got to get the context of when is this going to happen. He's setting you up for what's going to take place in the last days. For instance, if you read Colossians, and we have several of our female students, they have to outline some of the passages in the book of Colossians. And when they go through and they do their outlines or do a commentary on it, they net recognize pretty quickly that the word Laodicea is mentioned all through the book of Colossians. The reason that's important for you to know is, is in Revelation chapter number 3, as far as time is concerned, the last church mentioned is the church of Laodicea. Laodicea simply means the rights of the people. So when you come to 1 Timothy chapter number, 2 Timothy chapter number 3, the first thing you see is, is that in the last days perilous times shall come, men shall be lovers of them own selves. That's Laodicea. That's the rights of the people. That's people are ahead of everything else. That's, it's the meistic society. It's all about me. It's what's in it for me. The cesspool from which the other 24 things in that passage come from, comes from the cesspool of self-love. That's where you are now. That's the time of things now. It's all built upon what's in it for me. Job said it best. Job's the oldest book in the Bible. Job said it best. Skin for skin, all that a man hath, he'll give for his life. Meaning that when it comes to how I think about things, I think of me ahead of everybody else. Now that's not the Lord. In Philippians 2, he tells you that we ought to each esteem others better than ourselves. But that's not human nature. Human nature is me first and everybody else last. Human nature is, is that I'm self-absorbed. I'm self-sufficient. It's all about my self-esteem. It's all about my rights and what I want to do. That lovers of self fits in with pride over there in the book of Proverbs chapter number 6 where he says six things that the order, yea, seven are an abomination to him. And then he says a proud look and a haughty spirit and so on and so forth. And he that so with discord among the brethren. Pride is in one of the six things the Lord says seven are an abomination to him. Pride is is based on self-love. It's based on the fact that I don't feel like I'm getting what I think I ought to get. Covetousness will be mentioned in just a minute. That's one of those sins that you rarely see on the outside. You can't necessarily see how it's distributed or how it is uh, 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 demonstrated on the outside. And nonetheless, you may find by the time we get there, it's something that all of us possess. And it's not always for a materialistic possession. Sometimes it's for recognition. The old preacher used to say this, be real careful about self-promotion. He said, because of, if God promotes who He wants to, and sometimes He'll promote somebody you don't like just to see if it gets under your skin. You ever think about that? That's a mouthful. God's the one that promoted them, but you despise them for being in the position that they're in, and God's the one that put them there. And instead of you saying, well, if that's what God wants to do, that's fine with me, you covet the position they have, you covet the rank that they have, you covet the money they have, you covet the husband or the wife they have. When that book says in Exodus chapter number 20, and he comes down through there and he's talking about the Ten Commandments, and thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, that's more than just in a fleshly sense of coveting the neighbor's wife. It's coveting in general everything that goes with what somebody else has. 
That has to do with it comes from being a lover of yourself. That comes from I desire things for my own. So individually speaking, what we can get from this, the last days here is not talking about the time of the Jews. When James talks about the last times in James chapter number 5, James is talking about the 12 tribes of Israel. When John mentions the last days, John's talking about the nation of Israel. When it's mentioned here in Timothy by the Apostle Paul, it is mentioned in the last days for the church age. So he's fixing to show you, whether you like what you read or not, the next 25 things that come up are written in stone. There's no changing them. The church age is going to end in apostasy, and it's going to end with these attributes being manifest. So if you want to know if you're in the last days, as we go through these things, you start looking to see whether or not you see these attributes showing up, and the, the, the seed that they come from, the root that they come from, are, is self-love. Come to Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. All the perversions of human nature, of the human heart, uh, they come from that, from self-love. Now, just because this is how the church in and of itself is going to end, doesn't mean you as an individual has to end that way. It's not a prophecy that you're going to do this and therefore you have no way out of it. It is a warning to you that if you don't pay attention, that's where you're going to wind up. And if you don't keep yourself in check, I've learned this, nobody can keep you in check. Nobody can. You can't keep your kids in check unless you practice by, rest by restraining them. Eventually your kids grow up and they make their own decisions. Is that right or wrong? If they decide to do it, you can't change them from doing it. Now, you may be able to restrict them from being able to be in a position to do it. For instance, a lot of times kids grow up and they say, you know, well, I'm leaving. Okay, unless you chain them to the wall, unless you lock the door, they leave. That may mean that the door's locked when they get ready to come back in and can't provide for themselves. But nonetheless, if that's what they choose to do, let me give you a little bit of relief. You can't stop it. You've done all you can. It's not in their best interest, but you can't prevent them, nor can a preacher or anybody else prevent a Christian from doing something that's in the flesh. So you have to give people the understanding that when they act out of character and they do things that are fleshly or carnal, that it's not the preacher's fault and it's not your fault. It's that they made a bad decision because anytime that decision that you make crosses their free will, you're out of the box. You can't control other people's lives. You can't control how they feel about you. You can't control how they act towards you. But you can do it in the sense of that's inappropriate behavior for where we are now. If you're going to continue to act that way, then you need to leave from this place that you are because that's unacceptable right here. That's what they make jails for. That's why they have prisons. That's why they have the death penalty. If people don't want to do what the law requires them to do, the way that you get them to do what's right to do is you restrain them or you punish them. You understand that prisons were never ever created at the beginning for the purpose of rehabilitation. Prisons were built for the purpose of punishment. It was never, it was turned into a social club when they figured out how much money they got on it because what they began to realize was is the chain gangs and all the other stuff that they used to do way back in the day, they thought, shoot, man, we can get paid for education. We can get paid for dental care. We can get paid for medical care. We can get paid for education. We can make money off of them by cheap labor, by prison labor, by giving them a dollar and a quarter and an hour, but we can hire them out to build things and to do things like that. Shoot, man, the prison population becomes the slave population of America today. I'm not, I'm not saying prisons are wrong. I'm saying that they were never devised as a rehabilitation facility. They were devised to punish the people that had done wrong. And then what happens is the courts get involved and people get involved and the bleeding hearts get involved and well that's too harsh and well that's too much. And so now a lot of times people go to prison and live better than they did in prison than they did when they were out of prison. Now trust me, I still wouldn't want to go to prison. But prisons are for the purpose of people that won't conform to what society's norms are. You put them into prison to say, listen, if you're not, there's going to be a consequence. And if you don't want to change, that's fine. We're going to lock you away so that you can't infringe and take your rights and infringe on our rights. Are you with me so far? I think the epitome, the pinnacle of the temple of a self-lover is a pedophile. 
They don't care anything about who they hurt. They don't care about the innocence of children. They care nothing about anything but their own self-pleasure, what they want for themselves. They actually begin to think in their own mind that there's something right about what they're doing and they're doing the kids a favor and those kind of things. Okay, I don't believe that those individuals can be rehabilitated. Now, maybe you differ with me and that's fine. It's your opinion. I might have a little more uh, experience with that than you do. But at any rate, I don't believe they can be. So what do we do with a person that doesn't want to conform? You lock them away. You say, why? Because you don't have to keep tolerating them and adjusting yourself to wrong behavior. That's why he says at the very end of that, from such turn away. He says, you, you need to learn to get away from people that are having an impact on you in a negative manner. For instance, I've tried to extricate myself from all the, the panic mongers. You know, all the people that are, that, are, that are worried about things and they're just constantly wringing their hands and constantly questioning everything and all that other kind of stuff. I have enough of that if I watch the news for more than 15 minutes. So I have some people that give me some very valuable information. I have one guy that gives me unbelievable filtered information that he goes through and he filters stuff out and I'm able to, to pull some stuff out of that kind of stuff. And he said to me, he said, you know, I'm beginning the more that I look at this to realize and what a deep, dark state we are as far as the United States and how close we are to World War III. I said, I agree. He said, well, he said, I wonder if Christians recognize how close we are to the demonic possession of the United States of America. And I said, no, they don't. He said, why not? I said, the Bible says in Revelation chapter number three, they're rich and increased with good and have needs of nothing. Know not that they are blind and miserable and poor and naked. I said, they're blind as a bat. Laodicea, they're lovers of themselves. The last days, it's all about themselves. They're not thinking about anybody else. They're not thinking about their nation. They're not thinking about their leaders. They're not thinking about their first responders. They're thinking about how's this going to affect me? Are they, what are they going to do to me? When do I get my check? When do I get my, my uh, stimulus check? How come I didn't get a stimulus check? How come they got a stimulus check? How come that big company, corporation got a stimulus check bigger than my stimulus check? Well, I should get a stimulus check every month until the government goes brank because I don't want to go to work because I didn't like working anyway and I like being at home even though I can't. And the next thing you know, it's me, 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 me. Where's the handout? Where's the handout? Where's the handout? You're literally fulfilling biblical prophecy. It's literally in the Bible, but I'm not in the book of Revelation. I'm in the book of 2 Timothy. So the last days when he gives you these things here, the Bible's going to show you here in Romans chapter number one. Look, if you will, please come all the way down to verse number uh, 20, 120. For the invisible things of him are clear, uh, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they're without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were they what? They are self-entitled. You owe me. You live in a generation now, and I'm sure they probably said the same thing about my generation, although I had enough sense to keep my mouth shut and not say anything about it. But you live in an unthankful generation where kids grow up nowadays. One mother told me last week, I said, that she's struggling with a couple of things. I said, turn your kid's phone off. Lord have mercy. I thought I was going to have a stinking uh, fight on my hands. Turn my kid's phone off. I said... Yeah, why does your kid need a phone? Isn't that like 40, 50 bucks a month? Can't you, you're, you're out of work right now, don't you need? Oh yeah, but I don't know what he would do without his phone. I don't know what you're going to do without a meal. Now some of you kids, all of a sudden, you kind of look at it in the carpet thinking, better not turn my phone off, bless God. I don't, yeah. Yeah, but you see, you see, I got to have it. Why? Because that phone makes me important. I'm, I'm somebody. I got however many followers. I can get a hold of my boyfriend and girlfriend. I can have the apps and hide the apps behind the apps so that mom and dad don't know what I'm doing, where I'm going. I can't get on my social media. I can't do that. Lovers of self. Well, you know what? Uh, old old uh, uh, Zuckerberg's a smart guy. He knew more Bible than a lot of Bible believers. He knew if he could develop an algorithm that would revolve around self-love, he could make billions of dollars 
and be hauled up in front of Congress and get his day in the spotlight to talk about what an influence Facebook was to all the people in the entire world and get up there in his suit and be able to answer things. A little old guy that went to college and did something in his garage and came up with a thing built around the premise right here, self-love. And as long as you have that, you know what that whole thing's driven by? Well, you know what it's driven by. It's pictures of you. It's posts about you. It's contacts about you. Now, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Don't, don't get mad at me. Oh, well, you hate social media and all that other kind. No, I'm just telling you what the Bible says. You judge it wherever you want to judge. Well, I don't believe that. Okay, put your head in the sand. It doesn't matter. I learned a long time ago, you can't force people to believe even what's right to believe. Haven't you seen that in the media nowadays? People start believing certain things. They say, well, that's an outright lie. Well, I don't care. One guy, you know what he said? Something really stupid. He said, you know what? I don't care if so-and-so is uh, boiling babies and eating them. I'm still not going to vote for the other guy. I'm thinking, are, are you serious? You just made that statement? You're, you're that foolish to make that kind of a statement that I don't care what the truth is. I hate the other guy so bad that I'm not going to vote for him. So I don't care what this guy does. Even if it's 100% wrong, it makes no difference to me. I'm not doing it. You know what? You live in a, lay, a day and time, ladies and gentlemen, where that thing is on a fast track. If people want to know whether or not we're close to the end of time, all you have to do is look at human nature. All you have to do is look at what's, what drives human beings. It's the love of self. Now watch this right here in Romans chapter number 1. Is this making sense to you? Don't worry, you only got about 30 more minutes of it and then you'll be out. You say, well, preach on the virus. Why? <laughs> Doesn't help you any. You ain't got it. Because, verse number 21, because when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were they thankful, but became vain in their imagination. Their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of an uncorruptible God into an image made into like corruptible what? First step before they turn Him into birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things, they make God themselves. They turn God into an image like them. So what they do with God is, is they correct God. I know what God said, but. Isn't that what the devil did in Genesis 3? Am I in the ballpark or no? Uh, they disobey God. They're not worried at all about any uh, ret uh, retribution whatsoever. Disobey God. More than just from homosexuality. A whole lot more than that. How about slandby, uh, slander and envy and strife and division and debate? Besides all the other things. How about bitterness? That's a good one. You ever take a look in that Bible, you look in the Bible, you start reading through the book of Esther. That's a great book for you to read. You start reading down through that book of Esther. You get around chapter 5, the number of death, judgment, destruction. Esther comes in there and he extends the, 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 the scepter and all that kind of stuff. And then he comes down through there at about verse number 10 or 11 or whatever. The king calls, uh, calls uh, Haman in there. And he says to Haman, he says, uh, Haman, I'm asking you a question. I'll paraphrase for you. He said, yes, sir, boss, what's that? He said, well, he said, if you were going to throw a banquet for somebody that's real special, a real, uh, real to do. I mean, you really wanted to do something. How would you do it? Haman immediately thinks, he's talking about me. <laughs> well, uh, I'll tell you what I'd do, he said. I, I, I'd do this and I'd do that. Boy, I mean, I'd put on the dog, man. I'm telling you what. I mean, I, I'd, have him, I'd have him wear the king's robe and I'd put him on a donkey and lead him around in the whole town and have people kneeling down before him. He, man, because he, he's thinking... See, he's thinking, because he loves himself, he's thinking that they're, he, they're going to recognize, the king's going to throw me a surprise party and put me in charge of it. You know what happens when you have that mindset? You start listening to people that validate what you want to do and what you want to be. You must be right. You must have the right attitude. Then you get people around you and it and entitles you to start listening to bad advice. You say, what did he say? He went to the people and said, well, you know, Mordecai, he's getting in the way. Mordecai, the king calls him in all the time. The king asks Mordecai for things. And the king, he ought to be asking me. I'm special. I'm so, I've always been there. I've been the king's right-hand man. And he's calling in Mordecai. And Mordecai this and Mordecai that. I'm so sick of Mordecai. I'm so wore out with Mordecai. I'm so fed up with Mordecai. I tell you what I think we ought to do. I'm fixing to have a big banquet. But I think what I ought to do is build a gallows. What do you think? They said, yeah, man, build a gallows. 
We agree with you. Get rid of Mordecai. I mean, I don't know why the king's recognizing him anyway. He ought to be recognizing you. And if he's not going to do what's right to do with Mordecai, I mean, build a gallows and hang him on it. You got power anyway. It's about time they recognized you. About time they elevated you. About time you eradicated. That old guy, he ain't nothing but a hemorrhoid to you. Man, I mean, he's a burr under your side. That guy is just trouble. I mean, get rid of that guy, man. He's the reason you're having so much. You can't even enjoy your day. He comes walking by in the palace on the way back from the king's meeting. and I mean, yeah, build a gallows. You know what happens by the time you come to the end of chapter 5? That man is so bent on getting the one that got him, he doesn't care who he hurts. He takes pleasure in hurting other people. You say, what is that? It's self-love. I don't care who I hurt. I don't care who gets in the way. I'm going to have my way. You get completely deluded by that. So you know what happens? I'm going to disobey God. I'm going to do what I want to do. I don't care who God puts in a position. I don't like them. I don't care about them. God didn't consult me. I disobey God. I invent my own God. It'll, it'll resemble me. This is, if I was God, this is how I would do it. If I was God, this is how I would handle it. If I was God, I would do this. Or if I was God, I wouldn't have done whatever he did that's upset you along the way. Invent your own God. You never would do those things God does now, would you? God ever done something in your life and you think to yourself, well, if I was God, I wouldn't have done that. You ever done that? If you're honest, He has. You know what you just did? You just said you know more than God. I'm not trying to be harsh with you. I'm just saying that when you, did, when you said that, you just said God didn't know what He was doing when He allowed whatever happened to you to happen. That's a bold statement. That's a real trial of your faith. Do you think God didn't know about the virus coming? Well, if I was God, I'd have stopped it. You sure you even know why it was started? I'm at least smart enough to say, I don't know. You say, is it judgment? Is it set up for the Antichrist? I don't know. I couldn't tell you. Is it a set up for the vaccine that contains the mark of the beast? Well, I hope so. Because I can't take the mark of the beast because I'm not going to be here. So if it is, I'm gone. Y'all stand around. People are arguing, if that has the mark of the beast, are you going to take it or not take it? Uh, I'm not. Oh, so you're on our side. No, I won't be here. They're, they're worried about having enough of the, of the product to go around. Is there going to be enough of the product to go around? <laughs> well, if it has the mark of the beast, y'all can have ours. We're gone. <laughs> You'll have plenty. I mean, we, there'll be plenty of that to go around. But, you know, well, is there going to be enough vials? Yeah. Well, I don't know what happened to all them other people. They disappeared. So they can have that. But what begins to happen and what you're beginning to see now, believe it or not, even from pulpits, is developed from self-love because they get so hung up with their new theory, their new idea, their new revelation that they begin to defend themselves as if it's personal as opposed to what does the Bible say? So you have to be real careful about it. All right, come back, if you will, to 2 Timothy. So in the last days, um, the, there's a, a doctrinal issue that happens. Go to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. 2 Timothy 4. Now he says in 2, and, uh, uh, 2 Peter chapter number 3, uh, about verse number 3, he says um, that in the last days that there will be scoffers saying, where's the promise of His coming? The scoffers are coming from people that know enough about the Bible to understand clearly that the Lord was supposed to come. So now, what are you hearing? Well, there's no such thing as a rapture. Well, there'll be a rapture, but it's not going to be before the tribulation. Well, the rapture won't happen. The Lord will just come down and it'll be the second coming because... There was a guy in the 1800s named Darby that came up with this notion that there was going to be a rapture and that's really not even in the Bible. So what are they, where's the promise of His coming? It's coming from the pulpits now. Where's the promise of His coming? Because guess what? He hasn't come yet, so He must not be coming. That's not what it says. You're literally from the pulpits, even in Bible-believing churches, are saying, I, I know what it said. They're scoffing. Add those of us that are pre-tribulation rapture. 
Some of you are already catching heat for it because they think that the virus is that we are having one of the plagues in the book of Revelation. Trust me when I tell you what is going on now won't even hold a candle to what happens during the tribulation. You won't just have 100,000 people die in the United States of America. They will be dying by the millions, by the millions. Right after the rapture takes place, there's a fire that comes down and destroys a third part of the earth. How many billions of people you think that is? In one fell swoop. And they'll know it came from God. It won't be it was created in a lab and jumped over to a wet market and then traveled from a bat to a rat to a pig to a person and to flights coming out of Wuhan to different places in the world to spread it and that kind of thing. It won't be them trying to trace it and whether or not they're going to have trade sanctions or whether or not they're going to go to war. Uh, China is going to go to war with India and they're going to fling nukes at each other and Russia or the United States is going to invade. This is all recent in the news. If you don't know, I'm, I'm giving you up-to-date news right now. And whether or not Iran is going to go ahead and destroy Israel because they're still saying and whether or not Netanyahu says, well, at one point we're going to be defending ourselves and probably the United States won't step in. This is all going on right now, right this minute, right now. You say, what is it? It's a tinderbox. It could go off right now. You say, well, then that would mean we're in the tribulation. No, that would mean that we're having tribulation, but we're not in the tribulation. Amen. Amen. But it could jump off. But when that thing happens in the tribulation, they'll know exactly who it is. It's God doing this to us. There won't be any questions. There won't be a few preachers saying, you know, we're, we're in the path of the, tri the tribulation is here and the horsemen have begun to write. Pastors agree. My foot. Well, this pastor don't agree. This is a, this is a plague. It's a bad deal. It's a terrible thing. But 100,000 people? Come on, seriously? That's a bad deal. I mean, I mean, be politically correct. Just one is too many. You ever look at how many people die for drunk driving every year in the United States? I don't see anybody calling that a plague. If you judge a plague by how many people die, have you ever noticed how many people die from substance abuse? I don't see anybody calling that a plague. How come everybody wants to, you know, kind of look, I don't know about all that stuff in there? Because I can tell you why. You could stop that plague. You stop selling liquor. Liquor's destroyed far more homes than an invisible Amen. virus. And liquor still has destroyed more homes than all the drugs put together. Crack and cocaine and heroin and teas and blues and all the other kind of stuff and all the opiates and all the barbit all the stuff. The liquor still destroyed more. You know why? They don't want to stop it. Why not? It's revenue, man. Amen. It's tax revenue. You're not fooling me. That's why you don't want to talk about uh, drunk drivers killing people. That's why it's right there. Because you've got the cure. You won't take the cure. You don't need a vaccine for it. You stop selling liquor. i got to be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen. It's hard. I don't know why. I don't know if some of you see it or not. Forgive me. I'm going to get off for just a second here, and then I'll get right back on the train here. But when you have a, a, a state that will consider what you would call essential personnel homosexual bars, but you consider in the same state church is non-essential, you definitely have a problem. Amen. When you consider bars and weed shops essential and churches not essential. Look, I don't care about a label. The president said we're essential now. Okay, you got a title. You want the title or a chest to pin it on. What is, so what, I, what? We're, we're essential. Who didn't know that? Well, we're so... We're, they don't think we're essential. Are you kidding me? Go suck your thumb. Change your diaper. We're, we're essential. Well, if you have to announce you're essential, it's like announcing you're the man of the house. It's like everybody knows you ain't because you had to tell everybody you are. Are you with me? Come on, help me a little bit. It goes down a little bit quicker. But, but here's the thing. Your country is whacked out because it is under a demonic influence. Okay, if that's the case, what do I do as a church? Well, as a church, the Bible said in the last days, scoffers. If you read the context of 2 Peter chapter 3, those are not individuals that are walking down Main Street and some night show host is putting a microphone in their mouth, in their face and saying, uh, can you name more presidents or more beers? And a guy can rip off about the names of about 12 beers and can't name you 12 presidents. This isn't that. 
This isn't people out there, what do you think if Jesus is coming or not? Jesus? Who's Jesus? Something I cuss about. I don't What are you talking about? It's people in the church. It's preachers in the church. Scoffers. Where's the promise of His coming? Ain't going to be no rapture. The promise of His coming. They've been saying that for years. It ain't coming. And then guess what? You get over to 2 Timothy chapter number 4. Preach the Word. Be instant in season out of season. Preach the what? Word. Preach the Word. Not the headlines in the newspaper for your state Amen. or CNN or Fox or politics or prejudice or your own personal opinions about things. Preach the Word. Be instant in season out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long For the time will come. That's what we're looking for. It's sandwiched right after chapter 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and be turned away from the truth unto... Well, there you go. There's your last days. You say, well, who's that talking about? He's saying there's a time coming where preachers are going to preach what people want to hear. They don't want to hear sound doctrine. They don't want to hear reproof and rebuke and exhortation. What they want to hear is, is they want to hear some fable. Tell us what the newspaper says. Look into your crystal ball. Play Nostradamus. Tell us what Gene Dixon said. Tell us what Edgar Cayce said. Tell us what the prophetic Indian said. What the Mayans said. Tell us about the blue stars. Tell us about the Hopi Indians. Tell us about all the things that people are predicting of how it's going to be in this and that and the other. Anything but the Word. So now you know what you have? You have guys that get in the pulpit. They don't have a Bible in the pulpit. Bring your iPad, one guy said. Bring your telephone or don't bring anything. It doesn't really matter anyway <laughs> because we ain't going to be using the old King James anyhow. Why you, what, where'd that come from? Why you, why you, of all the Bibles you could mention, we ain't going to be using the old King James anyhow. Wow. Well, what is that? It's a fulfillment of prophecy. I'm actually trying to encourage you. I'm not getting on to you. I'm telling you, you're getting closer to jumping off place. That pressure is going to increase and increase and increase and is going to get exponentially greater and there's going to be turmoil in places you never saw turmoil. You say, why? The devil is right at the point where he recognizes the Lord's fixing to split the sky and we're fixing to get out of here. So guess who's in target right now? It is not the rest of the world. It's you. You're under the gun right now. That's why your families are having trouble and that's why things are happening in your families and things are going to make you go through what Job went through right before the Lord showed up and blessed him. But didn't he go through hail Columbia? And you not mean you're going to go through the tribulation period, but it means that you're going to have trouble. Nobody having any trouble during the virus? You know what I read today? They did a study. I don't know where the study came from. I couldn't find the origination of the actual study they did. But a couple of, you know, bean counter thinkers and stuff like that, they got together in a think tank. And here's what they said. A third of the population of the world right now is suffering from anxiety and depression from being uh, locked down. Even if they don't know it. You know what I know? I think their numbers are way off. I think it's more like two thirds. I'm not being funny. People say, well, I want a great vacation. I want to have a good time. I want to, so, so stay in your room. How's it working out for you? I can get gas for $1.50 a gallon, $1.35 a gallon, $1.20 if I look real hard for a gallon, and I, got gas. I ain't got nowhere to go. Right? Go, I mean, what a great time to take a vacation, have a few days off, but where are you going to go? Ain't got no money to spend. After a while, it's kind of like, well, I've cleaned the house and cleaned the baseboard and cleaned out the closets and watched every show and binged every Hallmark thing there is to binge and <laughs> watched every movie 50 times. And I, I'm getting tired of sitting on my blessed assurance. And then you go outside and somebody's like, you're not wearing a mask. <laughs> you go to the grocery store to get some popcorn. You're going the wrong way down the aisle. I, I'm calling the aisle police. Sorry. I did do this the other day in the grocery store. The arrow was here and the thing was right there. So I, I walked in this way. <laughs> I know that was terrible. Don't y'all pick up my bad habits. But I only had to go right there and I thought, I'll be jumped if I'm going to walk all the way down there, turn around, come all the way back down here. I could see it right there and I'm thinking. You say, what is attention? 
It's tension being cooped up. It's tension. It's pressure. You don't even recognize the pressure cooker that you're in. Try to get in a little Bible, a little bit of prayer, and you have a hard time with it. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Can you stay with me about maybe 10 more minutes? Are we doing okay? I know we didn't have any singing or anything like that. but So the falling away that takes place, takes place just before the rapture of the church. I forgot to give you one. I think it's in Philippians 3. Philippians chapter number 3. Yeah, that's it. So in, so in the last days, that falling away comes and the doctrinal issues begin to take place. So you have to find out where to put your hope and your faith and your trust and it has to be in the Bible. And so you have to continue to believe what God said as far as the Bible is concerned. Now watch, Philippians chapter number 3, look at verse 17. Brethren, be ye followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have for us for an example. So Paul sets an example with them. He says, mark those that are around you. They walk like we walk. They have the same doctrine. They're of the same mind. For many walk, of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. That's pretty strong talk. Paul called the ones with false doctrine enemies of the cross of Christ. In the book of Galatians, he said they have that anybody that teaches you anything different than we teach, let them be accursed. Let them be damned. The Lord said about false teachers and false preachers, there's reserved a place for them called the greater damnation. That's greater than the lowest hell. Meaning if there are degrees in hell and it looks like there are greater or degrees of disintegration that are there, uh, it looks to be that those individuals who teach things spiritually wrong, that God puts them in a category all to themselves. As a matter of fact, he says in the book of Revelation chapter number 22, they lose their part if they're saved out of the book of life. They don't lose, take their name out, but they lose their inheritance for teaching something spiritually wrong. You're in a day and time, ladies and gentlemen, where people need spiritual truth now more than they ever needed it. They need a solid foundation. They don't need a bunch of conjecture. What do you think? How do you feel? So you better stick with something greater than yourself. You better stick with what the Bible says. Because ultimately, every one of us at some time or another is going to be wrong. I know that's hard to admit sometimes. That every one of us has to say, I was wrong. But the book's not ever wrong. Amen. Notice what he says. He says, mark them. He says, the, their enemy is the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly. Oh, isn't that what we're talking about? Lovers of themselves. Whose God is their belly, whose glory is their shame, who mind what? Earthly things. First John chapter 4. Now, don't go out and say that I'm accusing everybody that doesn't preach what I preach of being in the category. I'm saying that you need to know what's safe for you to listen to and what's not. Anybody that is currently interested in current events and always trying to tell you how you should or shouldn't be in this day and time and not telling you about the hereafter is not telling you what the Apostle Paul told you in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He gave you warnings, perilous times were coming, and he gave those warnings way back when he was alive. And he's saying, this is part of what you're supposed to be preaching and warning the people so they don't fall into this trap. And what is the trap? It's on self-love. It's on lovers of yourself. Notice what he says in 1 John, Believe not every spirit, in verse number 1, Try the spirits, whether they are of God, because the fault, many false prophets have gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesseth not Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof we have heard that it should come yeah, and even now already is, in, is it in the world. Watch. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them because your greater, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore, they, uh, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. That's a pretty disconcerting thing to say, well, what's your congregation? Well, it must be the world because the world's listening to you. So the antithesis of that would be a preacher that preaches and he's not surprised when the world doesn't listen to him because what I'm preaching right now is not for the world, it's for saved people. 
The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, for they're spiritually discerned. Why does a preacher have a responsibility to get up and sound like a politician? I'm not trying to reach the world. I'm trying to reach you. My congregation tonight is saved people going through trouble, going through trials, fixing to move to Colorado. They're going to have to uh, take off, which I'm still... I think we send one at a time like Joseph. You know, I'm just saying, you know, maybe... Maybe Jacob sends one brother at a time and we keep the other one back hostage to make sure you return. <laughs> Better count your kids when you pull out next week. But, but, but here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen, and, and please don't misunderstand me. I'm not trying to speak disparaging remarks against my contemporaries. I'm trying to say that a lot of people think they've found their voice because they're speaking on current events. This event will eventually pass and it'll be replaced with another one. And then you've lost your credibility because you've said a bunch of things that amounted to nothing. I'll, you know, well, preacher, you're not saying anything new. Well, why should I? If I'm preaching to you what the Bible says, I should preach to you what the Bible says, and we let the Bible stand as opposed to our own opinion stand. We are of God, and he that knoweth God uh, heareth us, and he that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know that we're the spirit of truth, and the spirit of what? Come back to 2 Timothy. I'll try to put a, a bow on this. Paul says that in the last days, he says, uh, when I leave, he said, uh, grievous wolves will come in from among you. So he warns you that in the last days, those are the things that are going to take place. And what's going to happen is, is perilous times, dangerous times are going to take place. And the first sign is not the writers of the apocalypse. It's not earthquakes. Paul makes no mention of earthquakes and tsunamis. He makes no mention of, of natural phenomenon happening in the sky as far as weather is concerned, or tornadoes, or hurricanes. Paul makes no mention of that. Paul says prophetically, when it's getting to the end of times, here's the things you can look for. It's not the stuff in Matthew 24. It's not, Master, give us a sign and tell us what we're going to look for. Oh, there'll be rumors of wars and wars. Of... Can you find Paul saying that anywhere? In the Pauline epistle? It's not there. It's noticeably absent. Isn't that a fair statement? It's not in there. You have to go somewhere else in the Bible like a fellow that I know now. He's trying to teach something that he wants so bad to be true. But in order to do that, he has to literally ignore the foundational doctrinal truths that are written in the Bible in order for him to teach what he wants to believe. And then you have to stretch these other verses in the Bible to make them say something that they don't say. And none of them are through the Pauline epistles because you can't rectify what he's trying to teach with the Pauline epistles. There's no signs in the Bible where the Apostle Paul says, watch out for the governmental takeover. Watch out for wars and rumors of wars. Watch out for famines and earthquakes and pestilences. Paul says, no, you better watch around you. You better watch lukewarmness among you. You better watch perilous times. You better watch self-love. You better watch yourself. You better watch for false teachers and false preachers standing in the pulpit. First, or Second Corinthians chapter number 11, who the Bible says that Satan is a minister of light and his teachers, his preachers, they're his emissaries. They're ministers of righteousness, but they're demonic. That's what Paul says to watch out for. He doesn't tell you to, nowhere in there does he tell you to watch for the Antichrist. The passage he talks about in the Antichrist is in 2 Thessalonians and the inference there is made out to be that when we're gone, that guy shows up. The comma right there separates, I think, the rapture and then the next few things in those passages have to do with what's going to happen in the tribulation period while we're gone. You say, well, preacher, you know, I believe we ought to be looking for the Antichrist. Well, help, you, uh, help yourself, but Paul tells you to be looking for Jesus Christ. Well, it's a sign. I'm not a Jew. I don't require a sign. Uh, lovers of self is the thing that shows up in the last days. It's a very important thing. All right, what is a lover of self? Um, look in, I already gave you Philippians chapter number 3. I already gave you the stuff on pride in Proverbs chapter number 6. All right, lovers of your own self. What does that lead to? Covetousness. Notice what he says. Covetousness. And then what are we doing? What are you boasting on? What are you bragging on? What is covetousness? The grass is always greener on the other side. I always want something better than what I have. I deserve something more than what I currently have because I believe I deserve more. I haven't gotten the, the, everything that I should get. 
I, I, I deserve more than I've got. Come to Romans chapter number 7. It's born out of a thought that we deserve more, we deserve better than we currently have. It, like envy says, I may not have it, I might not want it, but I don't want you to have it. I may not have it, I might not want it, but I don't want you to have it. It's twin is pride, it's brother to jealousy. That's what self-love is. That's what covetous is. It is a sin that very few, if any, will ever admit to having. It is one of the top ten in the Exodus chapter number 20. Uh, but you wonder why? Because it's a trait of last day's Christianity. One of the top ten. Thou shalt not covet. Right? Let me get to Romans here real quick. A covetous person will go to great lengths to obtain whatever it is that they are after, even evil surmindings, carnal speculations, and slander. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. They can so be, be so moved by bitterness that they use surmising to benefit themselves and their agenda to take advantage, to spin a web by which they can extricate or remove somebody from a position that they want. That's what covetousness will do. Covetousness, the Bible says, is as idolatry. In another place, stubbornness is as idolatry. It takes you over. It's considered to be one of those things. Sometimes you covet status, sometimes position, sometimes power, sometimes prestige. There's evidence of lying, stealing, adultery, murder, disobedient to parents, taking God's name in vain, uh, malicious uh, 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 acts, graven images, having other gods, but there's usually very little or no evidence of covetousness because it can't be seen on the outside. Eve coveted the fruit and it caused her to fail. Cain coveted the recognition that God gave to Abel and it caused him to be kicked out of the garden. Aaron and, Aaron and Miriam, uh, Miriam coveted Moses' position and because of the priesthood, Aaron, Aaron, Aaron got protected, but Miriam got kicked out of the, of the uh, camp because she was making fun of Moses' wife, but the fact of the matter is she coveted Moses' position. And God gave her leprosy. That's a tough thing. That's Moses' sister. But when it comes to the family issue, God said, I don't care if you're a family or not. That's the guy I chose and you better keep your lips off of him. You know, you know who Mar Moses married? Yeah, I know who he married. Zipporah. I know exactly who he married. Well, you know, I mean, you know what, what Zipporah was. What are you trying to infer? She was a black lady? Sure looks that way. Well, guess what happened? When her and her brother got to making fun of Moses for that, God smacked the tar out of them. Well, preacher, the way I feel, I don't care how you feel about it. God didn't care how they felt about it. God didn't care that that was his, uh, his uh, sister. God said, that's it, sister. You're out. Get out of the camp. You're intruding into something you have no business intruding into. I don't know who died and left you boss or who you think died and left you boss. You're out. Covetousness. Well, I don't know who Moses thinks he is taking all this upon himself. I'll tell you what. See, that thing of talking about his wife had to do, that was the cover they hid behind. They looked for this righteous reason to justify the fact of the matter is she wanted to be the boss. And God looked at that thing and said, I ain't gonna have that sister. And struck her down. If it hadn't been for Moses coming in and saying, Lord, I, I'm, I'm all right with it and that kind of a thing. And I'd appreciate it if you'd heal her up. Aaron's over there whimpering and whining and saying, well, I, I kind of bought into it. And I kind of let her sway me. And Moses says, yeah, you and golden calves, you have a tendency to do that kind of thing. And Aaron said, what are you talking about? Well, you'll find out later. And so he, he, he listens to Miriam and Miriam stirs up the pot. And the next thing you know, they come against Moses. And God says, I'll tell you something right now. I ain't a respecter of persons and blood ain't thicker in the Bible when it comes to me. Now, I'm not trying to be hard on you, ladies and gentlemen, but a lot of this foolishness going on nowadays is based on that self-love, covetous premise that says, I'm going to get my time in the spotlight if I have to shove everybody out of the way and at everybody else's expense, I'm going to say what I want to say and do what I want to do. And by the way, that's my uncle and that's my daddy, that's my granddaddy and this and that. And God looks at it and he said, I don't care who, it, who you're related to because blood ain't thicker than the book. Now, that's a hard lesson for Southerners. That preacher said it time and time and time and time and time again, and he was not from down here. He was from up in Topeka, Kansas. He wasn't from the South, but he was a Southerner. But you know what he said? If that book says one thing and my grandmother says something else, my grandmother's wrong. 
And then he said, if that book says one thing and my wife says, my wife's wrong. And down the list that he went to that thing. But boy, bring that in the South. And he's got, well, I, you know, I, 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 you know I, I mean, I know what it says, preacher, but okay, well, it gets you in trouble. Blood's not thicker than the Bible. Moses and Ariam, uh, Ariam. Moses and Aaron and Miriam, a good example. Uh, what got uh, Achan in trouble? He coveted the wedge of gold, the silver in the Babylonian garden. What got Ahab in trouble? I want Naboth's vineyard. Here's a good one for you. What got David in trouble? In Genesis chapter number 3, Eve got in trouble. Why? She's looking and thinking, I deserve that. I don't know why he wouldn't let me have that. I want my way. I mean, after all, Adam ain't all that in a bag of chips. I mean, you know, why shouldn't I have a little something for me? Covetousness. Get you in trouble. Romans chapter number 7, if you're there, and verse number uh, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not what? I wouldn't even know what lust is if the law didn't tell me what covetousness is. I don't know what lust is. Why? Because when lust takes over, come to James chapter number 1, the next thing you know, covetousness blinds you. David's one of the bravest men in all the Bible. Nobody ever questions David's, uh, David's bravest, uh, bravery. Never. But it got him. Didn't it? You know what got him? Covetousness. He covered it his neighbor's wife. You say, it'll never get me. Well, it got David. It got Achan. It got Cain. It got Ananias and Sapphira. It got uh, uh, Aaron and Miriam. It got Mother Eve. Pretty, pretty strong list of people got by covetousness, isn't it? Should we be aware? Why should I be aware? Preacher, that's Old Testament. Careful now. Paul on epistle. Lovers of self, covetousness. The mother of covetousness is lover of self. I deserve that. Boy, you live in a day and time right now where people say, well, I don't really want it and I don't even need it, but I just don't want you to have it. So I want to get it just so you can't have it and I'll have something you want. I don't care about it, but I'm going to have it just because I don't want you to have it. Covetousness. That's a wicked thing if you can't imagine that. Why is it that's number two on the top 25 things of the last days that he starts off with in the last days, perilous times come. And he doesn't say and bombs are going to fall and towers are going to fall and tsunamis and earthquakes are going to go off and volcanoes are going to go crazy and they're going to have all kind of plagues and, and they're going to have people dying and they're going to have... They don't say that. You know what he says? He said people are going to love themselves. He calls that a perilous time. And they're going to be covetous. My goodness, man. Paul, you got to be kidding me, man. That's just human nature. What's the big deal about that? It won't kill nobody. It'll kill a whole lot more people than the plague. It'll kill your spirituality about like that. You covet something God hadn't given to you or you want it before God wants you to have it. Kill you dead just like that. Are you in James chapter number 1? The Bible says this, verse number 13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own what? Lust and enticed. Lust, in other words, you could put there, his own covetousness. And enticed. When people hear the word lust, they immediately think of sin, of sex. Lust is not always sexual in nature. You can lust after other things. Material possessions. You can lust after a position. You can lust after recognition. You can lust after, I didn't, wasn't raised the way somebody else was raised. If I had that kind of raising, I'd be a better person. You can even lust after bitterness. You, you love bitterness so much, you lust after it. You thrive on it. He said, lust, watch what happens, that when you lust, in the context of what he says here, lust is enticed, and then lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin when it's finished bringeth forth what? Oh, covetous can't get me, preacher. 
I've seen people get bitter. I've seen people get downright mad because they want something and they can't get it and God won't give it to them. And the next thing you know, they're mad about it because they think God should have given it to them and God winds up giving it to their enemy. God gives it to somebody beside them. Do you ever think of this? Do you ever think for just a second that maybe possibly, uh, look in Colossians 3. Somebody got that real quick? Colossians 3. I want to give you that one. This is where I wanted to finish tonight. You ever, you ever wonder about that, that maybe you didn't have it because God knows if you had it, it'd kill you? You ever think that it's God helping you, not hurting you by not giving you something? You ever heard, oh, it's God give me a million dollars. If He did, would you be in church tonight? If you did, would you let it go to your head and let everybody know what a big shot you were? I don't know. Maybe you could handle it. I couldn't tell you. But, you know, sometimes you can tell that. But you see individuals, some people know how to handle that. Other people, man, whew, they hit it big in the stock market and everybody knows about it because they think it's equated with how successful they are. Look at the amount of money I make. My, my husband's a doctor. Okay. Well, I'll come see him if I'm sick. Well, what I'm saying is, is you know what kind of money he makes. Okay. Oh, so you weren't telling me your husband's a doctor because if I need a doctor to come to... Oh, oh, I get it. You were telling me that as a status symbol. Like you went to medical school and you're a doctorette or something? I know what I'm talking about. That's where that air comes. Oh, my, my husband's a doctor. We don't sit around the campfire and eat barbecue and stuff. We... It's, not us. Our kids don't go to those camps where y'all sweat and have mosquitoes, throw water balloons at each other. and Yeah, we don't, we don't go to those things. We go to equestrian camps. <laughs> Colossians 3, mortify therefore your members which are where? Are you with me? Colossians 3, verse 5. Mortify your members which are where? Upon the earth. Thank you. Fornication, uncleanness, and order and affection, evil concupiscence, and covetous. Uh, what? 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 Look at the company of covetousness, which is idolatry. It's self worship. Look at its company fornication, uncleanness, in order and affection. Evil concupiscence, that's irregular or, or un, uh, uh, unbridled thirst or lust after carnal things. And some of that does have to do with physical things. And covetousness, look at the company, look at the bed, look at the bed brothers of covetousness. Do you see it? Every one of those is born out of covetousness. It's you getting what you want. You deserve it. That's why a man will leave a wife and kids to pursue other deals. Covetous. I want to be satiated like I was when I was 20. Instead of accepting the responsibility of I have a, a wife and some kids to take care of and I got responsibility. It's time to put on your big boy pants. Even if you're not always doing everything she wants you to do, at least you're paying the bills and you're staying with her. I bet you there's a bunch of women even in this church that'd love to just have a man that'd be faithful. Even if all he did was just come home every night. Well, there's the mic drop. <laughs> Let's stand together. We'll be dismissed.